between my John. John, where are you? <laughs> and we switch the computer. I'll do two lines of introduction again. Uh, John Gerard, he's an artist who's based in many different cities, but mainly in Vienna, right? Um, yes? Okay. Uh, so John creates simulations that explore structures of power and networks of energy. Um, his work often features geographically isolated locations, such as the, the agrarian American Great Plains, the, the Mojave Desert Solar Plant, the remote reaches of the Gobi Desert, or sites of military exercises in Djibouti. Perfect time for my short introduction. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, okay, yes, thank you. Lights go off. Power goes off. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. It is wonderful to be here. Thank you to the Kuju Biennale, Bethany and Natasha, for inviting me to be here. And, um, okay, I have about 20 minutes. Um, I better go quick. So, um, yeah, my name is John Gerard, and I typically produce um, simulations, virtual worlds, and they are normally shown um, on major LED walls in the public domain. Uh, this is a work called Solar Reserve that was shown at the Lincoln Center in New York. This is a work uh, called Western Flag that was shown at the um, Somerset House in London, and more recently, this is a major LED wall that was shown in the Okayama Art Summit, uh, showing a piece called Ex Levis Space Lab, um, up above uh, a wonderful landscape by Pierre Huyghe, with a performance landscape for Tina Segal and various different amazing artists, so just come from there, it was an amazing experience, I have to say. But the reason I'm here today is to talk a little bit about a problem that I had and what I did to try and solve it and in a sense that is coming this way. This is a work which was commissioned in 2012 uh, by Modern Art Oxford. Definitely actually showed it in Wit the Wit after that. Um, and it's a piece called Exercise. Um, it's a piece called Exercise, uh, Exercise Djibouti. And within it, I came across what I described as the timeline problem. And the timeline problem is as follows. I'm going to have to move quite quickly. If I really am speaking too fast, the interpreter just has to wave her hand. But, so, this piece, Exercise Djibouti, involved a group of athletes. Uh, I produced virtual portraits of them. This is a 3D scan. And uh, they became avatars. As such, they became virtual characters. And um, they, in the work, should run in a figure of eight, um, timed by the release of camouflage smoke. So we brought them to an enormous motion capture studio, one of the biggest on earth outside London, and they did indeed run in a figure of eight uh, for three hours until they could no longer run. But they were very fit, so that was okay. And um, as you can see here, this is what happens. If you put athletes into a motion capture studio, you just get the little points in space, which is data, information about movement in space. So, after a lot of work, it became this piece called Exercise Djibouti, in which this group of people run in a figure of eight in the middle of nowhere in Djibouti. Um, but this video is important because it reveals what I describe as the timeline problem, and I'm going to run it for you. Here you have a virtual world, which is an open world. It is kind of timeless in a sense. It's not time-based. And here you have one capture displaced in time and distributed across a number of iterations of the same character. This is just an artifact from my production, so we never exhibited this. But it's interesting because if my character stops, it reveals what I describe as the timeline problem. He will stop. So here, the athlete has stopped and he collapses in upon himself because this is a timeline. This is uh, 
you know, the historic timeline dropped into the open space of the game engine of the virtual world. So, how am I going to fix my timeline problem? Uh, in which I have an open virtual world and I have motion captures coming in to produce animations, but they are from cinema. They stop and they end. What should I do about that? So, um, I, around that time, started coming across these very strange images on the interweb. And um, it was this thing called Deep Dream, which was produced by Google. And, um, you know, strange, over-processed, over-computed images, which in a sense are something of a gimmick. Uh, this is a cloudy sky. This is if you over-process it with Deep Dream. Uh, but what is Deep Dream? It's a neural network which over-interprets images and it can kind of reveal a bias within the original neural network, the training set. There's too many animal images within it. So every time the neural network looked at a scene, it was just like animal central. And everybody was like, oh, the computer is dreaming, hallucinating, all the rest of it. But it's interesting because it got me thinking about what is this neural network thing? I mean, you know, who knew what a neural network was? Certainly I didn't know what a neural network was in 2015. But Deep Dream, apart from reminding me when I took too many mushrooms, also just told me to look at this particular thing. So neural networks are absolutely central. I think a lot of you know about this, but I'm just going to quickly throw it to you. They are central to self-driving cars. You can teach uh, these, these machines how to see in some way, shape, or form. Cars that drive themselves need to understand the world. So neural networks allow that to happen. Google, of course, is a big proponent of self-driving cars. But what is a neural network? Most simply, it's an input, you've got a set of layers, neural, artificial neural layers in the middle, and the output is, for instance, the word dog, the input is a photograph of a dog, and it is able to interpret what that is using this kind of artificial neural network system. Um, come along to the 2016 Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Art and Tech Grant, and I had a speed dating, I'm not kidding you, um, incident with Google, and uh, you know, many other tech entities in California, and you know, obviously my speed dating with um, Google paid off because they wanted to date me. And uh, so I said to Google, can you help me solve my game engine animation problem by using your neural network? And they said yes. And the project became Neural Exchange, which is as follows. This is my sister Esther. <laughs> And uh, this is a long time ago, this is 2003. And uh, I've been interested in these figures, these leaf covered figures for a very, very long time. They have a certain power. And my lovely sister Esther was very patient with me when I insisted on dressing her from head to toe in green leaves. Uh, so when I wanted to find a character for my neural um, exchange project with Google, uh, I decided to revive this leaf-covered figure. So what is a leaf-covered figure? It's an old, medieval, uh, pre-medieval, ancient figure that's covered in leaves. Here you can see one in a 13th century cathedral in Germany. Uh, here you can see one in the cathedral of Foliot Head in England, cropping up all over the place. But nobody really knows what they are. They also exist within folk memory. This is a leaf-covered figure. Um, I think this is in Northern Europe. This is in Italy. There's a sort of no real sense of what these things are, but they're sort of older figures which relate to a period in which Europe was particularly covered in forests. But I think there's also equivalents in Asia and Africa. You know, it's just like a figure in, almost embedded in the landscape. So here is uh, um, the modeler, Max Logler, who I work with. Here is uh, my very patient programmer. We didn't have an actor that day. And uh, he, um, you know, we revived in the Vienna woods this leaf covered figure. Uh, then over about six months, uh, we rebuilt all those little twigs and leaves as virtual objects, as you can see here. And, oops, that's my favorite slide. And the programmer is looking at, he's a computer scientist. He would always look for an existing solution. This is an existing paper, generative choreography using deep learning. Uh, the only problem is it's computer science, so that's what you're going to get. So we said we have to look at this idea of using neural networks to produce a choreography, but it has to do a bit better than this. Um, so I'm not going to read this because I don't have enough time, but anybody wants this slide, I will send it to you. But this is my programmer talking techie tech. Snap, snap, snap. Okay, everybody's got it. And this is a little more techie tech tech.
but it's just any of you techie nerds in the audience need it, just grab it, okay? <laughs> this, uh, 15 minutes isn't very long, I just want to say, just to <laughs> kind of get through all this stuff. Okay, enter Esther Balfe, who's a wonderful dancer. She worked with Willem Forsyth for a long time. We have to bring life to these characters, or, you know, animation to these characters. So we developed a set of very legible gestures. Uh, she then performed them, as you can see here. That's one. This is another one. There we go. Uh, get her into a motion capture suit, which takes motion and turns it into information in time and in space. And what we can do is, that's the avatar. So she's performing and the avatar is basically taking that information. Here you can see a sort of interrelationship between the physical and the virtual, but really what you're producing is this. This is one second of maybe 16 or 17 points in space. They're moving in space and in time. So this is what you train your neural network with. This is what you expose your neural network to. That's one second, that's a minute, and to cut a long story short, um, lots of to and fro but after you have trained your network, it has learned four actions, and we were able to perform this piece called Neural Exchange, which is a piece of research in 2017 in Los Angeles, in which this figure, so it thinks about things a little bit, makes me a little nervous, and then finally gets around to doing one of these actions, basically. Thinks about it a bit more. We had another layer about like, decision-making in terms of what action should come next. But anyway, so this is not an animation. This is a neural network producing a performance which in theory has no duration. It could go on and on and on. It doesn't have an end. If you remember where we started, it was kind of uh, uh, start, end. This is a neural network piece of artificial intelligence as such, which can perform this simple gesture over open periods of time. It never has to finish. So it suits the virtual. It suits the world of the virtual. So, um, enter Global 2020, and 10 minutes, doing pretty well. Um, European Capital Culture and Guangzhou Biennale 2020, because the commission for this work, eventual work, comes from Global 2020, and we will, I believe, very happily tour it to Guangzhou, which we're delighted to do. And uh, it's now two parts. One is called straw work, and the other is called leaf work. I'm going to briefly describe those two characters, which are strongly related. But to begin with, I'll just run over what we've been doing with leaf work in the interim. So this is my sister's woods. My sister is a farmer. I have five sisters, in case you're wondering. I have lots of sisters. I'm blessed with lots of sisters. So this is her oak tree. She has the most magical oak tree uh, beside a very ancient well in, in, in rural southern Ireland. And rural southern Ireland is interesting because um, it's a thin veneer over, I suppose, ancient animist, animistic beliefs. You know, it's still... It's, not much between a Christian overlay and a kind of older set of beliefs. Scratch the surface and they pop out pretty quickly. Um, and this is a local um, actress who agreed to uh, be all dressed up in oak leaves from this tree. And so we're developing this character, developing this character. And um, then we do a performance where she walks out of the woods just to kind of get a sense of her character. And she did just this weird, sad character. It's funny, she's like super melancholy. Um, I, I think with good reason, to be honest with you. But uh, anyway, so we have cast a wonderful dancer, um, um, Fanola Cronin, who is an older dancer. Uh, she's in her 60s. She worked with uh, Pina Bausch for uh, 15 years, and she just has a lot of precision, a lot of kind of, I would describe as melancholy in her presence. Here we are working on the auditioning process with her. Esther Balfe has moved to become what she describes as a movement analyst. And the whole work centers very strongly on this object. This is a solar cross. It is a historic symbol for the sun. And it was later in, embedded into Christianity to become the Christian cross, but it's historically a symbol for the sun, uh, which I've been interested in for a long time. It's a kind of a solar wheel. And I was interested for these straw-covered characters to perform, uh, the leaf-covered character, to perform this object, this, this memory. So we mapped it out with different variations on the floor. And this is uh, Fanola Cronin, who is manifesting this leaf-covered figure, this melancholy figure, and performing uh, in a motion capture suit. This time it is wireless, it's not wired. And she, in this section of the work, is connected with ocean temperature, which I'll talk about more in a moment. So this is a kind of 
normal temperature, I would say. Um, this is just captured directly from the training set, as we described it, the training set with which animates the neural network eventually. You can get to know the character slightly better. Um, but really, instead of being animated by season, she's animated by ocean temperature. And we're using something called Argo, which is about 4,000 floats in all the oceans of the world to provide us with, with data. You can see them all over the place. And it's, it is public domain. This is broadcast in the public domain. Um, people are also need to know that the oceans produce about 70% of the world's oxygen, which is interesting. And they also are absorbing about 80% of industrial heat right now. So, you know, people talk about the forests, but they also need to talk about the oceans, because the oceans are getting hotter, and you really have warming in the ocean, which is a huge, huge, huge risk. So, this is a later in the temperature scale, three degrees warmth, and this character is really kind of struggling. You know, she's become a very pathetic, uh, she's barely surviving, to be honest with you. So, there's a real kind of melancholy to her performance, and this will be embedded in the work, which is both for Galway and for Longju. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But the straw work is a more human. It's, 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 the leaf figures are very old, are old forest. Straw is agriculture, you know, it's later. It's when we cut the trees and we sow grain, which is one of the great drivers of the expansion of human civilizations at the great cost to most of the living life forms. So straw boys in Ireland are a bit kind of, they're a bit kind of trickster. They're a bit naughty, they turn up at the wedding and they drink all the drink and they, you know, they're a bit sort of, you know, bad. And, uh, you know, like some of us. And, uh, but they're these kind of interesting characters which are embedded in the landscape. They're embedded in food landscapes. Because, you know, we live in a type of oil, in time of oil in which food is just endlessly abundant. These figures recall a time where you really had a reciprocal relationship with your immediate landscape. If you didn't take care of it, you would get hungry. You had to take care of your landscape. So people embedded themselves in some sort of sympathetic relationship with the landscape. And that is something that is so distant from us now. But I'm interested in these characters. So to cut a long story short, a lot of research, working with a wonderful weaver, who's a friend of mine, Jeremy Williams, and uh, we recreated this system, we worked out how they did it, we created the system, and we're making these straw figures. Uh, this is me. This is me. I was a really fat straw figure for some reason, I don't know why. So this is me in my father's farmyard in North Tipperary in Ireland. This is me cutting the grain because we have to cut it by hand because if it goes through a common harvester, it gets too damaged. And this is Vienna with the straw which we brought from Ireland, developing four seasonal characters, spring, summer, autumn, winter, um, this is spring, which is a kind of naughty, kind of young character. Summer is a bit more formal, autumn is actually kind of aggressive, and winter is kind of sad in a sense. But um, here, this is less organic, this is a, really a solar cross, because the straw figures are about social coordination, production, domination. Uh, they are about the wheel of human consumption, which is rolling across the world relentlessly, tripling the world's population in the 20th century. And this is an incredible performer who is called Ursula Robb, who is autumn, and she is very aggressive, she's very powerful, because in the harvest, you do not get in the farmer's way. The farmer is pulling the food in, and I tell you, I've seen it, it's very aggressive. The whole year has been focused on this particular field, and if you try to get in the way, I mean, they will drive right over you, basically. So this figure is kind of human, coordinated, aggressive consumption and production in a sense. Like it's a kind of a wheel, but it's not an organic wheel. It's a mechanized, coordinated wheel. Here you have a performer, again, live streaming our training set back to the interface. And you can see her walking through the solar cross here. Um, and she's got these kind of points of aggression where she turns and sort of asks questions. Here you have, a, uh, you have a stream. This is an entirely virtual figure, so this is completely 3D. But the motion capture that's coming in is very, very organic. So it has this sort of power. Um, and then that is the core of our training set, which becomes a, basically the data set for a neural network, which is the next step. Um, okay, so the last thing I'm going to say in my last one minute, because I am late. Um, Go away 2020, um, I work... I'm so excited to work in the landscape with LED walls. 
I mean, the irony about working in technology is obviously you are producing these kind of, you know, in a sense, energy-hungry situations and then speaking through them to contemporary conditions. But this is an LED wall in the desert in California. This is an area I'm really interested to work in the landscape with these objects. Uh, this is Ireland, where we will cite the leaf-covered figure. Here we're trying to cite it. Um, we're putting a mirrored pavilion out there so when the public walk up to it, they see themselves. And if they come from the other side, they see this melancholy alternate reflection of themselves as consumers on the LED wall, which fronts. So that's the back of the side and that's the front. Um, all the energy which gives rise to this installation is derived locally. Uh, so from the rivers, from the wind, from the sun, uh, from the sea. So we don't use any uh, carbon-based energy to animate the scene. Obviously, the LED walls and all these things consume a lot of carbon to be produced. But the actual life of the work on the landscape over the year is only animated by local resources, such as this. And the straw figure will be in the city, kind of in, in the urban setting, and the leaf figure will be way out in the middle of nowhere. And they're both coming in some shape or form to Guangzhou in 2020, and that is it.